Welcome on this massive open online course on the isolation of extracellular vesicles by ultracentrifugation. My name is Willem Storvogel and I'm affiliated to Utrecht University in the Netherlands. In fact, I've already been working with extracellular vesicles for more than 25 years now. And in fact, my first experiments were on the ultracentrifugation of extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles are derived from cells either by pinching from the plasma membrane or through fusion of intracellular compartments with the plasma membrane. They vary in size and in composition. Um, so there's a huge variety of types of extracellular vesicles and one single cell type may in fact release different types of extracellular vesicles. One special type of ep Extracellular vesicle is the apoptotic body, which also is also released from the plasma membrane when a cell dies through apoptosis. So strictly speaking, apoptotic bodies can also be considered as extracellular vesicles. There are other vesicles in extracellular environments, and these include the intracellular compartments that may be released when cells die in an uncontrolled, non-apoptotic fashion through cell lysis. Uh, so when only a few percent of the cells die through lysis or mechanical damage, they may expel, release organelles from their intracellular compartments and they may pollute uh, genuine expelled, physiologically expelled extracellular vesicles. In addition, one in extracellular media and in body fluids, one can find lipoprotein particles. And these also vary greatly in size, but also vary in density. Finally, one may encounter many different types of protein complexes, but also protein RNA complexes. So there are about 10 to the 11 extracellular physicals in blood. Uh, and in culture media, this may vary, of course, based on cell density, culture time, uh, and also on the cell type that is being cultured. How then does the frequency of these EVs relate to other types of extracellular particles? And it's important to, to realize that these extracellular physicals are often in minority in, the, in comparison to other types of extracellular physicals. For example, VLDL in blood uh, um, occurs at about 10 to the 16th particles per ml, which is almost a million more than the extracellular vesicles. And there's about 100,000 fold more HDL than extracellular vesicles and about 10,000 fold more LDL than extracellular vesicles. And in plasma from non-fasted individuals, there are also chylomicrons present. In other body fluids, one may also encounter LDL and HDL. And also in fetal calcium, there is abundant LDL and HDL present. So protein complexes and protein RNA complexes are also present as indicated earlier, and these include the exomeres and the supermeres that were recently described in literature. Now, in blood, one can find about three times 10 to the eight platelets per ml. And this is almost as much as there are extracellular vesicles. In fact, platelets can be considered as a specific type of extracellular vesicle, as they also derive by pinching from, in this case, from megakaryocytes. There are about 10 to the 7 white blood cells and almost 10 to the 10th red blood cells. So one can already see that there are almost as many cells as there are extracellular vesicles in blood. There are also apoptotic bodies cell fragments and also intercellular organelles that are released from only a few analyzed cells. So the quality of the, of, the, of the harvesting of extracellular fluids and cell culture media is very important to limit the number of these type of extracellular particles. One should also realize that the 
the composition of the EVs that one has isolated, for example, by ultracentrifugation, is highly influenced by selective recovery and loss of EV subtypes during isolation. Um, so when extracellular vesicles are released, some of them may remain tethered to the cell surface, for example, by tethering. And those will never be free in suspension in extracellular fluids. It could also be that extracellular vesicles are released in a confined space through which migration is limited, for example, limited by the presence of extracellular matrix or because they are released in an immune synapse. It should also be realized that often the half-life of freely suspended extracellular vesicles is very often very short because they can be recaptured by either bystander cells or even in a distance in other tissues. So that really changes the composition of extracellular vesicles. So the extracellular vesicles that are found in or are isolated from extracellular, the extracellular milieu is often very different from the true composition that is released by cells. One should also realize that there is a huge loss of extracellular physical during isolation. Very large EVs uh, may even uh, be lost together with, for example, platelets when platelets are removed from plasma. Uh, also, EVs, large and small, tend to stick to plastics. Uh, and this is true for centrifugation tubes, but also pipettes and reaction files. And this also results in differential loss of specific EV subsets over others, changing the EV population that one has isolated. Also, one should realize that the isolation of EVs, for example by ultracentrifugation, may induce aggregation and therefore also loss of integrity and biological activity of those EVs. EVs are furthermore difficult to separate from all the other types of the previous mentioned uh, particles um, and therefore the isolation of EVs often requires the sequential application of distinct isolation procedures, including ultracentrifugation. So what is ultracentrifugation then used for? First, it's used to concentrate EVs from body fluids or from cell culture medium, but it's also used to separate EVs from other compartments, the earlier mentioned uh, lipoproteins, uh, for example, but also uh, uh, freely soluble proteins. But it's also used ultracentrifugation to fractionate EVs according to their size. And this is done by using differential ultracentrifugation steps, and I'll allude on, the, on that later. When other isolation techniques are being used, for example, density gradient fractionation or chromatography, EVs are often isolated from these fractions also by ultracentrifugation. Ultracentrifugation is also used to remove solids from preceding processing steps. For example, when one uses sucrose density gradient centrifugation or iodixanol centrifugation, uh, one may also want to lose the sucrose or iodixanol, uh, and one can do this by ultracentrifugation. Also buffer exchange, removal of certain salts, but also, for example, non-bound antibodies can be achieved by using ultracentrifugation. For ultracentrifugation, two types of rotors can be used. The first one is a so-called swing-out rotor. During centrifugation, the buckets that are placed in these rotors uh, get into a horizontal position in a way that extracellular vesicles that are present in this solution will migrate in a horizontal, horizontal way from the top in the tube to the bottom uh, of the tube. That means that there is no streaking of extracellular vesicles along the tube wall. 
It also means that there's a relatively long sedimentation path, particularly for those extracellular vesicles that start off at the top of the tube. And since the relative centrifugal force is directly related to the radius, uh, the distance of the extracellular vesicle to the axis of the rotor, you can imagine that the relative centrifugal force is increasing during sedimentation during the migration of an extracellular vesicle to the bottom of the tube. And most of these rotors hold up about six tubes. In contrast, a fixed angle rotor can hold many more tubes. And this can, of course, be an advantage when, when has, one has many different samples to process. Also, these rotors can spin at a much higher speed, meaning that they can generate a much higher g-force and therefore shorten the isolation time. The relative sedimentation path uh, is much shorter. And one can see this here in this picture. In this case, in this fixed angle, uh, extracellular physical will first migrate horizontally during centrifugation until it bumps to the tube wall and then it will slide along the wall all the way to the bottom of the tube. And the total migration path here is much shorter than that in a swing out rotor. That makes, again makes the isolation faster. Um, uh, but also one should note that the relative centrifugational force increases less from the top to the bottom because the difference in radius of the EV to the axis is much less here. And finally, one should note that in these fixed angle rotors, of course, there's streaking of extracellular vesicles along the tube wall. And this may not only affect the isolation or the separation of different types of extracellular vesicles, it may also increase uh, the loss of extracellular vesicles and it may lead to the loss of the integrity of extracellular physicals. When extracellular physicals, but also other particles, are being centrifuged, they experience a so-called relative centrifugal force, or g-force. And this force increases quadratically with the rotations per minute. And it increases linearly with the distance of the particle to the rotor axis. So during centrifugation, the g-force for each individual particle increases when they migrate from the top to the bottom of the tube. And since uh, this migration path length is very much dependent on the rotor type, the rotor type is often defined by a so-called k-factor. The sedimentation velocity of extracellular vesicles can be calculated according to Stokes' law, which is depicted here. And the velocity increases with the g-force. It also increases with the EV diameter, meaning that large EVs are pelleted earlier than small EVs. It increases linear also with the EV density, meaning that EVs with a high density are pelleted earlier than EVs with a low density. And it should also be realized that the holding fluid itself also has a density and that the EV density much must be higher than that of the holding fluid. And otherwise, if this is not the case, the EV will not be pelleted. And the greater the difference in density between the EV and the holding fluid, the faster the velocity or the higher the velocity. Um, another characteristic of the holding fluid is the viscosity. And the viscosity is also important because physicals migrate much less fast through a highly viscous solution, for example, sucrose. So one should report in manuscript the rotor brand and type and if one wishes one can also include the k-factor provided by the manufacturer one should report rotations per minute and also the g-max and the centrifugation time <laughs>
As indicated earlier, extracellular vesicles come in different sizes and densities. So when one wants to separate small EVs from large EVs, one can make use of differential centrifugation. In this case, uh, as depicted here by this scheme, a suspension of cells, and this can be a body fluid or a cell culture, is centrifuged at a relatively low speed, at 200 g. And this is sufficient to pellet cells and other particles, such as extracellular physicals, will remain in the supernatant. One can then half the supernatant, uh, transfer it to a new tube, and centrifuge a little bit faster, for example, 500 G. This will then pellet any remaining cells. Again, harvesting fresh tube, centrifuging now at an even higher G force, 2000 G. And this will then pellet a lot of the cell debris that you one wants uh, to expel from, uh, from, from your sample. And then in the secret step, one may want to centrifuge at 10,000 G. And in this case, large EVs will pellet to the bottom of the tube. When one then harvests the supernatant and re-centrifuges that again, but now at 100,000 G, one may also be able to pellet the small EVs. And in this way, one has separated large EV from the small EVs. So it is a number of subsequent centrifugation steps with increasing relative centrifugal force and also, of course, the time may increase. So in this example, uh, taken from one of our papers 25 years ago already, we have applied this technique to isolate extracellular physicals from the culture medium of a human B cell line. And you can see that a relatively small sample um, only 5% of the total is put here in lane 1 and 20-fold uh, more of each of these fractions is put in the subsequent lanes. And you can see that EV markers such as C37, C6381 and 82 are in fact enriched in this pellet P5. But that also some is already found in P4 meaning that some of these markers may also be present uh, in the larger extracellular vesicles. In contrast, markers, this is a lysosomal marker, LAMP1 and LAMP2, they are preferentially associated with the cells and not incorporated into these extracellular vesicles. So there are some aspects about differential centrifugation that one should realize. The first one is that the separation of large and small EVs is not absolute at all. And that is caused by two factors. One is that the migration path for each EV is different. An EV that has to migrate from the top of the tube to the bottom uh, has a much longer migration path than one that is starting off at the bottom of the tube already. And the other one is that the g-force increases from the top to the bottom of the tube, meaning that a single EV starting at the top is in fact accelerating uh, its speed during centrifugation when it migrates through the tube. Also, one should realize that the pelleting of EVs may cause the aggregation of the pelleted EVs at the bottom of the tube. Often, the aggregated EVs can be resuspended and in that way uh, deaggregated, but this is not a guarantee. Also, EVs may experience shear stress. This could be due to streaking along the tube wall and a fixed angle rotor. It could also be that when resuspending EVs from the pellet, uh, they may be uh, sheared. Uh, another aspect is that one should realize that, of course, not only the EVs are pelleting during centrifugation, but also other particles. So there is always a contamination of EVs by co-pelleting other extracellular particles. 
And the enrichment of EVs over those particles is of course very much dependent on the nature of these contaminants, their size and their density. So during ultracentrifugation, uh, solutes may in fact form very steep density gradients, particularly at the bottom of the tube. For example, when a suspension, a homogeneous suspension of iodexanol is being centrifuged at a high speed for a prolonged time, there will always be a very steep gradient of the pelleting iodexanol molecules here at the bottom of the tube, generating a very steep gradient. And uh, this generates then an environment of which the density is even higher than that of the extracellular vesicles, preventing the actual pelleting of the extracellular vesicles. This is also true, for example, for serum proteins. Uh, serum proteins such as albumin also migrate during centrifugation. And at the bottom of the tube, there will be a very steep gradient of serum proteins generated. And that they also prevent the actual pelleting of uh, extracellular vesicles at the bottom of the tube. And in fact, we found, in, and we reported on this, that the recovery in such a pellet may be very low, actually, only 5 to 10 percent, and may in fact decrease even further upon uh, higher centrifugation uh, times or speeds. Now, this can be prevented uh, by different means. For example, one thing is that one can uh, pellet extracellular physicals on top of a cushion uh, and in this way prevent the generation of such a very steep gradient. Such a cushion also prevents the aggregation due to pelleting at the bottom of the tube. Another application is that one may uh, choose a cushion with a density that is lower than that of the extracellular physicals and then in that case the EVs will migrate through the cushion and here one may have a very efficient removal of non-pelleting material here in the yellow from the pelleted EVs. And one can also use a combination of these two. So one can separate uh, or one can distinguish two cushions on top of each other. One a high molar uh, sucrose cushion topped off with a relatively low molar sucrose cushion, 0.7 molar. And EVs will then migrate during centrifugation through the top cushion and will be harvested uh, right here in between the interface of these two cushions. One should also reala realize that EV pellets are contaminated with exomeres and supermeres, and they have more recently been reported. So exomeres are non-membranous extracellular protein nanoparticles and they pellet usually um, at a very high g-force and only after very long centrifugation times. Supermeres are non-membranous extracellular protein RNA complexes and they are even smaller than exomeres and they pellet at even higher g-forces. But some of these exomeres and supermeres will already pellet of course at 100,000 g. So they will always contaminate to some extent the isolated extracellular vesicles. So intrinsic of the isolation of EVs by autocentrification is contamination with lipoprotein particles. Chylomicrons are usually found in lymph and in blood, not so in fetal calcium. But they have a density which is relatively low, even lower than that of water, meaning that they will not pellet, they will not pellet by ultracentrifugation, and they will rather float. So that's not really a problem. VLDL also has a relative low density. They're relatively large, in the order of 30 to 90, 90 nanometers. Uh, but they pellet very inefficiently because of this very low density. But some of these will pellet and will contaminate 100,000 EV pellets. LDL and HDL are even smaller, so therefore migrate very slowly during ultracentrifugation. But LDL has a density, 
which was also variable, uh, up to 1.06. And some of these LDL particles will certainly contaminate your EVs. HDL, although very small, they, some of them do migrate, uh, but they do have a very high density. About it's, their density is similar to that of extracellular vesicles, and meaning that uh, indeed uh, they will contaminate your extracellular vesicles. And as you remember, L, the concentration of LDL and HDL in blood, the number of particles is much higher than that of EVs. So their contamination is significant. The fact that EV pellets, when isolated by ultracentrifugation from blood, are highly contaminated by other constituents is illustrated by this particular experiment, which we published about two years ago. Here, blood was centrifuged at 100,000 G, and the extracellular vesicles uh, were then put on the bottom of a new tube and overlayered with an IOXL density gradient. Uh, and that's recentrifuged for four hours at high speed. And during this velocity gradient centrifugation, you can see that the EVs here illustrated by Western blotting with the EV marker CD9 and CD63 migrated from the bottom to the tube to about here a density of 1.10, 1.12. HDL, which was also pelleted to some extent, here illustrated by APOA1, one of the constituents of HDL, failed to migrate up to this position not because it hasn't a high density, in fact, its density is equal to that of EVs, but due to the centrifugation time, so it's smaller and hence migrates much slower. When we would show you the experiment at a longer centrifugation time, 16 hours, you would see that these particles now are well, are well present, also representing these fractions. LDL, which is much larger, and here indicated by A pill B100, uh, uh, did migrate and in fact has a very low density, so it migrated all the way up to the top of the gradient. Here at the bottom, you can see a silver staining of these same fractions, and you can see that there are many proteins that are probably not associated to HDL, uh, are also remaining here at the bottom of the tube. So these proteins were also pelleted uh, in the first phase of ultracentrifugation together with the extracellular vesicles, but now we're here separated from the extracellular vesicles. The contamination by lipoprotein particles can also be visualized using electron microscopy. So in this experiment, EV pellets were resuspended and then processed for whole mount transmission electron microscopy. These preparations were negatively stained, and as you now can see, and these two indicated by these two arrows are two EVs with a characteristic cup-shaped uh, profile after processing, that they are very different from the lipoprotein particles here indicated by the arrowheads. They appear as very light spots here, and which are also much smaller than these extracellular vesicles. Finally, I would like to mention some experimental precautions, quality controls and rules. First of all, it's important when you isolate EVs from plasma or density gradient fractions to dilute your samples first prior to ultracentrifugation. This is important to reduce the density of the media and also the viscosity of the media. For Cell culture media that make use of serum or cal serum or fetal cal serum, it is important to remove the endogenous extracellular vesicles from such sera. And one can do this first to dilute to 30% and then centrifuge these sera for at least 15 hours at 100,000 G. Then the pellet containing the endogenous EVs from those sera can be discarded. But don't forget also 
to discard the bottom 10% of the supernatant. As also here, there are still plenty of EVs present that fail to pellet due to the steep gradient formation at the bottom of the tube, as explained earlier. It's important to pre-cool your rotor and also your centrifuge at 4 degrees before you start off with, uh, with ultra centrifugation. And you can maintain your samples at 4 degrees during your EV isolation. Of course, it is important to balance your centrifuge well and to also to handle your tubes with care after centrifugation because shaking or uh, vibration of the tubes may dissociate your EV pellet from the bottom of the tube. Uh, also, it is important to remove that supernatant then very carefully uh, while trying uh, not to disturb the pellet. Here too, you can slightly tilt the tube uh, and then slowly migrate your pipette down uh, while sucking off the supernatant. Uh, remember, EV pellets are often invisible by the naked eye. And then, when all supernatant has been removed, you, has to, uh, you have to immediately resuspend your pellet in a buffer. And this can be done by re-pipetting with a pipette. Optional, you can, after repelleting, supplement your sample with excess buffer and then recentrifuge to remove any contaminating protein or solutes. In this case, it's not really a problem uh, because the EV pelleting in, at this stage will be very efficient because steep gradient formation at the bottom of the tube will not occur in the absence of excess protein or contaminating solutes. Uh, you have to report after isolation on the EV yield. So the EV markers in the pellet relative to, EV, to the same EV marker in your st starting material or in your ultracentrifugation supernatant. So you have to demonstrate that you have depleted your ultracentrifugation supernatant from your marker. You also have to report on the EV enrichment, meaning the EV marker per total protein as compared to the starting material. You also have to report on contaminations. So this can be intercellular organelles, could be lipoproteins, it could also be soluble proteins that are also present in your medium. You also have to compare the biological activity of your isolated EVs with that of the source. And of course, the increase in biological activity should relate to the relative enrichment of your EVs. Finally, this slide shows you all the references that I have referred to in the previous slides. This lecture is part of the Massive Open Online Course 3 about detection and isolation of intact EVs, and which has been organized by the Educational Committee of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. And you can visit this site for more lectures. Thank you for listening. <laughs>